it will all work properly. Okay, so your uh, PDF is very visible to me at least. So I assume everyone can see it. Yes. And um, you can start. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is this is a, a a sequel to. I mean, some of you were at last week's talk um, that Mel gave, and and he'd set this problem of finding an elementary way of showing that the roots of a complex polynomial depend continuously on the coefficients. Um, and this is sort of a, a sequel to that to his to the talk from last week, or maybe it's a prequel or, or a companion, an inquil, a, a companion to that talk, and. And at the time he made the, uh, he set the problem, I suppose what one should have done as a scholar is gone and, and, and looked up other, other proofs, but, but, but I'm, I'm fundamentally lazy in that regard. And, and so I, I, I tried to come up with a proof. And um, since it's sort of an 18th or 19th century problem, I tend to use 18th or 19th or 17th century approaches to these things. And, and, and so the argument that I came up with um, an early version then, this is actually different in a lot of respects, but, but uh, uses infinitesimals, but in a very primitive way. Um, okay, so. Uh, um, page down. So the fundamental theorem, and this is stated in delta epsilon form first, is that if you're given a complex polynomial, uh, written out uh, the way I've written out f here. Um, and uh, I'm always going to assume when I write f that the a sub n, that the leading coefficient is non zero, polynomial of the complex fields. Then for every epsilon, there exists a delta such that if you have a, another polynomial whose coefficients are within all within delta of the corresponding coefficients of f, then the roots are somehow within, within um, epsilon. And you've got to find a way of writing that out because roots can coalesce when you perturb coefficients a little bit. So the way I write it out is I write out the roots without duplication. So there's n roots for each because the complex field is, is uh, algebraically closed. Some roots might have multiplicities, but I write them out without the multiplicities. So there might be duplication in the lists of roots. And so that there's some ordering of the two sets of roots so that the corresponding roots are within epsilon. So that's, that's sort of a standard way, a modern standard way of writing, writing this question out. And, and a couple of comments. There's an inverse result that is that the coefficients of a polynomial depend continuously on the roots. And that's pretty easy. So Viet uh, had um, showed, I think as far back as, it's been known as far back as the 1600s. Um, that the coefficients are elementary symmetric functions of the roots, and those are continuous, and so it's 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 relatively trivial. Um, for this result, um, there exists. Uh, I, I apologize if if you start hearing loud noises over the background. Uh, I, I'm in a, a military flight path, and they're doing lots of lots of exercises with I think very old helicopters. Um, I think they're expecting to, to send the local helicopters off to Ukraine at any time, or uh, I don't know. So um, every so often there will be these, these, these horrible sounds. Um, anyway, there exist uh, a lot of proofs using, using mainly heavy machinery. Um, some of them use things like, like Lecrae's theorem and, and uh, just various things. Um, but last week, Mel described a, a, a natural um, elementary proof, not completely trivial. You have to write things down, but but nothing you don't need, nothing that you need more than than, than high school uh, level algebra for. And today, I'm going to write down what 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 is arguably a more natural and shorter proof, but it does use infinitesimals. So it would have been considered an elementary proof uh, before people started doing delta, delta epsilon arguments. And of course, I have to rephrase things. And, 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 and I guess to begin with, I have to talk a little bit about what, what, what infinitesimals I need. OK, so all the infinitesimals we need. So I'm going to assume the existence of an algebraically closed field, which I'm going to call star c, because I come from a non-standard analysis uh, tradition, um, which extends c and has some extra properties. So 
First of all, right off the bat, it's an algebraically closed field. So Mel was asking about adding things. Well, of course you can, it's a, it's a field. So uh, the elements of C, which is a subfield, I'm gonna call standard and star C minus C is going to be non-empty and those elements are non-standard. And I'm going to assume there's, a, there's an absolute value or norm on, on C, on star C, which extends the usual one, but it's not going to take values in star C. It's going to take values in some suitable ordered field extension of the reals. Um, and some of the numbers, I mean, I'll show you a picture in, 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 in a couple of seconds. Some, some of the numbers in star C have the property that, that they're less than one over N for every positive integer N. If you don't want to talk about somehow what it means to be a positive integer, and not have to, I mean, and not have to, to, to get to dig in deeper on star C. Of course, we could just write this as Z plus Z. Oh boy, this writing is not very good. Plus Z, uh, the norm of, of those things should be less than one, where we've done this some finite number of times. I'm going to have to write slowly if I do that. Um, you have a lot of blank space down there. Which you're yeah, not I, I, the problem isn't that. The problem is is that that there's a, there's a lag. I'll send you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway, so the things that are that are that 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 are small in this regard, Archimedean small, are called infinitesimals. And of course, it's a field. So non-zero elements have reciprocals. And so reciprocals of uh, infinite, non-zero infinitesimals are called infinite. Um, anything that's not infinite is finite, which is another way of saying the same thing is that you get the same kind of, of sum less than, than n for some finite. Well, it's, it's you're a finite if, if your absolute value is less than n for some integer n. And the finite elements of star C form a subring. Um, they're not a subfield because the reciprocals might be infinite, but they're a subring of, of star C. They're closed under addition and multiplication. Uh, is it the case that every finite element has a standard part? That is to say, yes. you can make the, okay. Yes. Right. And I'm going to be yeah. I'm going to be defining that in a minute. I'm going to have some more properties on this. Okay. On another screen. Yes. But here, here's the basic the basic picture. So you've got the, uh, you know, the I think of the, the standard complex number. The complex number is just sitting inside that red circle, and it's embedded into a bigger field star C, where the red circle is kind of still there, but there's stuff that's added both on the outside and also on the inside. And so the stuff that's sort of on the inside, but there's maybe more stuff added in, is the finite part, and then there's the the, the stuff very close to the the origin, which I've colored green here, is, is the infinitesimals. And, and, and so there's an infinite part I haven't labeled. Here's an infinite part out there. Okay, so that's the infinite stuff out there. So that's the picture that one has in one's head. And the norm or the absolute value takes its values along what looks like the x-axis here. This is this is in non-standard language. This is star, star. and it's a, a non-Archimedean um, ordered uh, field extension of the reals. You get star C just by taking star R and adding I. You can do that. Um, yeah. Well, sure. Um, it depends how many properties you want, right? The, the the best way of doing it is to take star C is to take C and take its star using something like a non-standard embedding or a, um, an ultra power product or using, using some tools from logic. You get a lot more. Um, for example, the algebraic closure. We want a star C to be algebraically closed. And if I just take star R and add um, you know, I times star R, it's not obvious that it's algebraically closed. I mean, it kind of, I mean, it sort of is if you believe things like the quadratic formula, but but anyway. Um, it would be automatically closed because star R is elementarily equivalent to R 
and R plus I is algebraically closed, so you couldn't distinguish between R and R stars by yeah. saying, right? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, but it's it's completely obvious if you do it as an elementary extension. <laughs> um, you don't have to make an argument. Yes. Okay. But it. So I'm just writing down properties. So I'll, I'll, I'll have, so I, one of the properties I've just assumed is the star, star C is, 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 is algebraically closed. And that, this, that I've got this, this absolute value. Okay, so some more properties that we need. We need a standard part map. So every finite element differs from, by an infinitesimal from a unique element of, of, of the original complex numbers. It's kind of a neglect neglect the lowest order terms kind of thing. And that actually uses completeness of, 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 of the complex numbers. You need to do, you need something there. And we'll denote it by the usual notation is to put a little, use a little, little, little circle uh, in front of the thing to be the standard part of the, of the number. And the standard part function respects normal arithmetic operations. If you start with two elements of the domain, two finite elements of star C, standard part of the product is the product of the standard parts, et cetera. Same for the, the 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 sum, the quotient, and for the quotient, you, of course, you need that 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 the b is not infinitesimal, because otherwise you'd be taking star a over star of something infinitesimal, and the standard part of an infinitesimal is zero, so that wouldn't make sense. So another way of saying the same thing is that the map taking z to the standard part of z is a ring homomorphism from the finite part of star c onto onto uh, onto the complex numbers. We say that two elements um, uh, that, that uh, two elements are, are infinitesimally close. That's the notation here. A is infinitesimally close to B. If their difference is infinitesimal, and that even makes sense for for non-finite uh, elements, as long as their difference is, is finite and infinitesimal. In particular, an element is infinitesimal if only if and only it's if and only if it's infinitesimally close to zero. And for any standard A, the standard part of B equals A is the same as saying that B is infinitesimally close to A. Okay, so you can construct examples of such star C using non-standard analysis or other tools from logic, such as lohenheim skolem theorem or ultra products or ultra products of C. You can do it using, you can do all of this using levi civita series. So you can, you, can, you can do relatively uh, constructive constructions of these kinds of, 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 of what we need for today. All right, sorry, David, I have yes. a question. So yeah. if you take the finite elements of star C, that's yeah. uh, a ring, yes. um, a domain. Uh, yeah. Is there any algebraic structure on the infinite elements of star C? The infinite elements alone without, without the finite ones? Um, or throw in zero if you like, but well, maybe you can. Um, I guess there couldn't. No, it's well. It's not closed under. It's it, it's it's it's. Um, you can't add no. or subtract them. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Right. And what about just the infinitesimal elements? Yeah, those are uh, um, an ideal, um, um, a multiplicative ideal. Okay. In the in the ring of of finite right. guys. Yeah. So yeah, infinitesimal times finite is infinitesimal. Um, finite over infinite, in, finite over infinitesimal is, is infinite. Um, yeah. Right. So what I should have done at this point is that there's a, there's a, a calculus book that Jerry Kiesler wrote. Sorry, for, sorry to correct you. Yeah. Finite over infinitesimal need not be, need not be. Infinite. Oh yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Finite <laughs> and non-infinitesimal over yes. infinitesimal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a there's there's a, a a calculus book that Jerry Kiesler wrote years ago. Talked about this briefly last week, and there's a nice and the first thing that they do that, that, that they do in that book is teach properties of the non-standard reals, and um, so there's a nice page from that which has all the stuff you really need, but just for the reals, not the complexes, kind of laid out in one page. And what I should have which is you know used to teach high school, uh, college freshmen. So what I should have done was included that page as a slide here, but I, I, I didn't. Okay, okay. So here's the here's here's another picture, and I probably used too small of a font for my my elements. So here's here's some infinitesimal stuff over here. 
So there's an epsilon plus delta i, where you think of epsilon and delta as being infinitesimal reals. And so that's an infinitesimal. It's reciprocal then is going to be, you know, here's a reciprocal over here. One over epsilon plus delta i, which is just epsilon minus delta i over uh, the square of the absolute value. So epsilon squared plus delta squared. And that's out at the infinite in the infinite part. So that's what the zero is supposed to represent. It's way out at infinity. Here's a standard part. So here's a, 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 a typical, a typical finite element, three plus epsilon plus two minus delta times i. So that's, uh, you take its standard part, you get to three plus two i. And so that neglects the epsilon and the, and the negative delta. Okay, so that's, that's how the standard, that's what the standard part looks like. It just sort of rounds off to the nearest, the nearest standard guy. And that's all the infinitesimals we need. We don't need things like the transfer principle. We don't need things like uh, um, saturation. We, these are all things that are really super important in non-standard analysis. We don't really need those here. We just need basic infinitesimal operations for today. Okay, so um, let's, let's talk about, uh, let's get back to talking about polynomials. Um, so let's suppose we've got, so F is always going to denote a, a polynomial complex coefficient. So a standard, a standard polynomial. And I'm usually, when I write this out like this, I'm going to assume that A sub N is non-zero. Non and so the R sub I's are the roots possible with duplication. And typically when I write G, uh, the way I've got it here, B zero plus B one Z, et cetera, up to B N Z to the N. Um, I'm going to think of it as being a non-standard polynomial where the B sub I's are in star C. Um, of course, they could be in C. C is a subfield of star C. And the roots are S1 through Sn, which I'm going to assume are, are in star C as well. So, um, I mean, since I've assumed that star C is algebraically closed, every such polynomial has at least one root. And once you've got one root, you can do an iterative, um, an inductive argument to factor out things of the form Z minus S, where those are the roots, to get something of this form. To do that, you need some kind of a lemma to show that if you that you can divide a polynomial by z minus a root and you get another polynomial, and that actually is is is, is shows up in the as a lemma in the uh, paper that goes to the talk that 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 Mel gave last week, um, and you need something like that to get from exists one root to exist you know to to the, the fact that you can fully factor polynomials. I'm just going to be assuming you can fully factor. But I'm going to I'm going to be able to avoid that lemma today, um, mainly. Um, well, I guess I'm still going to be using the fact that 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 if you take a if you take a um, a polynomial um, and you factor it, you divide out by z minus root, you get another polynomial. But it's kind of impl if I assume that you can fully factor, then then you get that for free. Okay. Anyway. Some definitions. We say that G is an infinitesimal deformation of F provided that its coefficients are infinitesimally close to the coefficients of, of F. So you've perturbed each of the coefficients of F by an infinitesimal to get the coefficients of, of G. Then G is an infinitesimal deformation. And we say that G is infinitesimally aligned with F provided that if you order, that there's some ordering of the, of the two sets of, of roots, so that each of the roots of G is uh, infinitesimally close to the corresponding root of R. Okay, so this is, um, and so the main theorem in this terminology is that if G is an infinitesimal deformation of F, then G is infinitesimally aligned with F. Um, now, this is in fact equivalent to the delta epsilon uh, statement that we had earlier, earlier in the talk that I had here. But to prove that it's equivalent, you typically, it's just like the, the, the proof that, that the usual non-standard definition of continuity is equivalent to the, to the, de the standard definition of continuity. Um, it's an exercise. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a very commonplace, easy argument in non-standard analysis. 
but um, uh, not so easy uh, if you're just making assumptions about the existence of infinitesimals. I just thought I should throw that out. So it, it helps to construct your, 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 your field using, because you need something like the transfer principle. So it helps constructing your, non, your, 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 your um, star C using some tools of logic. But if you're willing to just state everything in infinitesimal terms, you don't need it. Okay, is everybody okay so far? I, I, I feel like I'm going, I don't know, either quickly or slowly, but, but there's not much left to the talk. But so far, so good. <laughs> yeah, not much left to the talk. Um, once you've got all these definitions down, then it's just, it's just super fast. So, so let's, let's, um, let's get to the proof. First, we need a technical lemma. And um, so if you've got a standard polynomial F and you've got a possibly non-standard pol polynomial G, consider the following three statements. First, the G is infinitesimally aligned with F and we need this extra thing. So I, I, I had uploaded a paper to the archive and I've had to upload a, a um, a correction, which I don't know if it's appeared yet, that doesn't have the statement in there. Because the, the, the thing is, if you've got the same roots or infinitesimally close roots, any constant multiple of you still has the same roots. So you have to sort of pin down and make it a monic polynomial or something. So, so I needed this extra bit. So one property is that G is infinitesimally aligned with F and the leading coefficients are approximately the same. The second one is that G is, an infinite, is, is, is infinitesimally close to F for all, for all standard Z. And the third is that G is an infinitesimal deformation of, of, of F. So these two are equivalent. So being infinitesimally close for all standard Z is the same as, as your coefficients being infinitesimally close. And, um, and one proves both of them. And of course, this direction to proving those guys is just what I, I call the inverse of the main theorem. Um, it says that the coefficients depend continuously on the roots. Uh, and so that's one that, 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 that's fairly straightforward standardly using something like, or some, it's standard like Vietas theorem. But, um, this is, is a non-standard proof of it that doesn't use Vietti's theorem. Okay, so, and these proofs are almost all the same. Okay, so how do you prove that one implies two if they're infinitesimally aligned, so they have approximately, the, um, so they have approximately the same roots, then they agree on all, approximately agree on all standard Z. Well, you take, you take, uh, um, uh, a G of Z and we take its standard part. We're gonna show that equals F of Z, right? For a standard Z. So we're gonna take the standard part of G of Z. Well, G of Z is just this product, right? Because we're assuming that we get full factorization. So we wanna take the standard product part of this product, but it's a finite product and standard parts uh, bring homomorphism. So we can do it term by term. So that's the standard part of B sub N times the products of the standard parts of Z minus Z sub i, and we can bring that standard part inside because it's a ring homomorphism. So it equals standard part of B sub n times this product. Standard part of B sub n is A sub n. Standard part of S sub i, we're given, that's what being infinitesimally aligned means, we're given the standard part of the, of the ith root of G is the ith root of, of F. And that last product is F. So that does it, that's the proof. It's just, it's just elementary calculations using the, uh, using the standard part map. How about showing that if G is approximately equal to F for all Z, then it's an infinitesimal deformation. That is, we wanna show that the coefficients are the same. If you know that the two things are equal everywhere. Well, so, okay, this is, this is again, just the definition of F. Um, this we're given that's we're given by, by, by two. G is just this, uh, you know, so this again is just the definition. G is just this, this sum. And then we can bring the standard part inside and take it term by term. Now, before I continue, I should say that there's a little bit of a caveat here. 
we need the fact that that the B sub i's are finite to take the standard part. So it's not completely trivial. Ooh, I really don't like writing in this, annotating in this version of PDF. Okay, we need that the B sub i's are finite. And so what you need is something like if you've got a non-standard polynomial, um, which is finite for all uh, standard Z, for all standard, if you plug in something standard, you get something finite coming out, then the coefficients have to be finite. And that turns out not to be too hard. What you do is you divide, if, if you've got an infinite coefficient, you divide through by the infinite coefficient. And that means that for all standard Z, the new thing when we divide it through by the infinite coefficient is, is infinitesimal. And if we've divided through by the largest infinite coefficient, then all the coefficients are now are now finite. And so we can take the standard part all the way through. And one of those is not zero, but you can't have that because for a polynomial to uh, be identically zero, all the coefficients have to be identically zero. So there's a little bit of an argument to be made so that you can do this, but we can do this. So now we know that these, that these two standard polynomials on either end of this equality are equal because the left-hand side is now a standard polynomial. It's got standard part of B sub i's there. And since the polynomials are equal, as polynomials, the coefficients have to be equal. And since the coefficients are equal, it means that the B sub i's are infinitely close to the, to the A sub i's for every i. Okay. So again, it's just a calculation. It's just an easy calculation. And then going the other direction, going from being an infinitesimal deformation to being infinitesimally close, um, it's the same kind of calculation. You just take the, uh, the standard part of g of z and you show that it equals f of z and you just do it by, by bringing the standard part map into the sum and doing it term by term. It's actually, the tech is easy because this, this line and the one above have exactly the same terms, just in a different order. Right, this is here, and and this is here, and this is here, and this is here and there, and okay. So it's conservation of typing. So this lemma is just all three of them is just a little bit of algebra. Okay, so that's the technical lemma that we're going to need. Now the first sort of real, real, real useful lemma, and. You remember that, that, that um, for those of you here last week, um, uh, a key fact was that, if, that, that every root of f, that if g was close enough to f, every root of f, you could find a root of g that was close to it. This is kind of the same lemma, only backwards. Instead of saying that, that, that um, given a root of f, you can find a nearby root of g. This says given a root of g, you can find a nearby root of f. And so if g is an infinitesimal deformation of f and you've got a root of g, then its standard part is a root of f. And first you have to point out that s is not, that a root of g is not gonna be infinite. If you had an infinite root of g, then zero, well, if it's a root, then zero equals g of s, so we can divide by, by s to the n. Uh, if you've got an infinite number, then, it's, then, 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 then s to the n is also infinite. That's, that's not hard to see. So if you divide through by s to the n, um, all the terms here are infinitesimal. And um, B sub n is infinitely close to A sub n, which we took to be non-zero, so A so B sub n can't be, so, so um, um, it's a contradiction. So every root is, 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 um, is finite, and now we can do exactly the same thing we did on the other line. Again, I cut and pasted uh, from the tech. I just plug the standard part of the root of G into the formula for F, and then I, I sort of backtrack and pull the standard parts out, you know, replace A sub I with the standard part of B sub I, and we pull the standard parts out. And S is a root of G, so that's zero, so it's zero. So the standard part of S is the root of F of Z. Okay, so, um, so the structure of this proof is exactly the same as the structure of the proof last week. You find 
one root that's that, that, that for each of the two polynomials that correspond, you kind of factor those out and then apply an induction. So now we're ready to prove the main theorem. So remember the proof, we're given two, two polynomials, G and, and F, and we're given that G is an infinitesimal deformation of F. So the, the coefficients are infinitesimally close. We wanna show that G is infinitesimally aligned with F. So we do it by induction. When n equals one, the only root of f is, is uh, right, if, if n equals one, then, then we're just looking at, at this for the, the two polynomials and the only root of, of, of f is negative a naught over a one. And for g, it's, it's, it's uh, negative b naught over b one. And, and by the way, here I'm using very much that, the, um, that a sub one is not equal to zero. So I can do that division and b sub one is then not infinitesimal. So I can take standard parts take the standard part of, of negative B naught over B1, and you just get it negative A naught over A1. So S, standard part of S1 is R1. So it's true for one, it's trivial, well, almost trivial. Now let's prove the induction step. And let's let S be a root of G of Z. Um, and so we can find, so, so the standard part of S is a root of F by the lemma. And we can factor out z minus r from f and z minus s from g. And I'm going to call the court what's left f hat and g hat. And those are polynomials of degree n minus one over the respective fields. I don't know what they are, um, but I, um, you know, they're polynomials. So a little bit of algebra. I look at z minus r times f hat minus z hat, g hat. And, and this is just, just high school algebra to get um, that this equals F minus G minus this thing, G hat times S minus R. Now this we already know is infinitesimal for any standard, for any standard Z, because we're given that they're infinitesimal deformations and by the earlier lemma, um, they differ infinitesimally. I mean, they, we're, we're given that they, they differ infinitesimally for all Z and so by the earlier lemma, G is an infinitesimal deformation. I'm sorry, we're, we're other way around. We're given that G is an infinitesimal deformation of, of F and therefore they differ by an infinitesimal for all Z. How about over here? Well, G hat is finite. G, at least if, if, Z, if Z is not equal to R, if, 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 if Z is not equal to um, R, then Z minus S is not infinitesimal and g hat of z is g of z over a non-infinitesimal. And so it's going to be finite. So as long as z is not equal to r, g hat of, of z is finite, but this is infinitesimal. So as long as z is not equal to r, the right-hand side is infinitesimal. And therefore, as long as z is not equal to r, um, f hat minus g hat is infinitesimal or f hat's infinitesimally close to g hat. So f hat is infinitesimally close to g hat for all z with one exception, namely z equals r. But that's enough to get that, that uh, um, the coefficient, that, that it's an infinitesimal deformation um, by the earlier lemma. And a remark that you don't really need them to be equal for all z, it, it suffices they're equal for infinitely many z to get the coefficients being, being the same. So G has an infinitesimal deformation of F. And now by induction, the roots of G hat and the roots of S hat can be put into a correspondence. So everyone's infinitesimally close to, every root of G hat is infinitesimally close to root of F hat. And then if we put R sub n equal R and S sub n equal S, then we've got that for, for every I, S, S sub I is infinitesimally close to, to R sub I. And then you know, excuse me, uh, yeah. about the, about you were saying it need infinitely many values. Uh, not, I think you don't need infinitely many values. It just needs as one. many as, yes, exactly, yeah. the degree yeah, plus yeah, one. Yeah, 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 you're solving n equations and n unknowns sure. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's n plus one. But, but the important thing is that if everything except for <laughs> one <laughs> works, if one was ever trying to extend this somehow to some other situation, that's all you really need. But yeah, you're right. It's just, you just, you need, you know, bigger than that. 
And if Archive ever gets updates with the newer version of the of the paper, I actually say that in a remark after the lama. But it's yeah. So that's it. I don't even have to. It's so so it's 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 really. I think. I mean that, that that proves the result. So it's it's really just the high school algebra here, if your high school students know how to use infinitesimals, which they ought to, and which you know, presumably they would have uh, hundred and some years ago. You know, there was a a um, in the early twentieth century, um, the mathematician Kanemori was a. Uh, uh, a civil servant in something, I think the department, something like the Department of Education. And he did a survey of, of uh, teachers across the country of whether um, they prefer to teach with, with infinitesimals, or they prefer to teach with deltas and epsilons. Um, and I, I guess there was some talk about standardizing things. And, and, and apparently it was pretty close to 50-50. Uh, I, I saw a history of math talk on this once, but I was never able to get the, uh, I wanted I wanted a copy of the, the, the speaker had a copy of the original survey, but I wasn't able to get that from him. Um, but so presumably at one time, people were regularly teaching infinitesimals. For the record, Bar Ilan University was teaching calculus with infinitesimals for a few years, first year calculus students. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've, I did it at, at Iowa for a year, uh, many, many years ago, and I did it as a, as a graduate student, as a TA at Wisconsin, which, um, where they used to teach, they used to te regularly teach a lecture using, using infinitesimals. And um, I know there's a private school in Switzerland that, 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 that has developed its own curriculum using, using infinitesimals. Um, so there, there's a couple of places that do it. Um, but it, it used to be bog standard. Um, I mean, it used to be just a normal thing to do. And so those students could easily have walked in and how, how long have I spoken? 40 minutes? 40, so it yeah. could have been, it could have been, um, this lecture could have been, you know, uh, two thirds of a, of, of a class, even less because presumably they'd seen all that, all that non-standard stuff earlier as part of the setup for the class. So this could have been, this could have been a twenty, a fifteen-minute lecture, in 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 a high school class, some number of years ago. Anyway, yeah. um, that's all I had. Um, I, I have a question. David, yeah, yes. David, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, the uh, in in uh, I'm trying to develop some geometric intuition as to what's going on, and I remember in the old days when they uh, would take, a, let's say, an algebraic curve in X and Y and a point on the curve, and they added to this point an infinitesimal, let's say a delta X and a delta Y, and you mm -hmm. do a little bit of algebra. And uh, if you just pick the differentials uh, of the first order, what yeah. you're getting is the tangent line to the curve at the given point. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to do something like that, not adding the delta x, but adding an infinitesimal to x and an infinitesimal to y, in principle, I should be able to do the algebra. Yeah. Uh, what do I get? What what's what takes the place the role of the tangent line with the infinitesimals? So. Um, well, if you're play, if you're if you're plugging in infinitesimals, then you get, you know, if it's in the reals, then then you get. Uh, you get the, the slope, I assume, right? Um, I mean, it depends what you're talking, right? Maybe I don't understand what it is you're talking about that, you know, the, the earlier the earlier example, but if you've got a curve, right? And you're starting here and you go here. So this is, this is X plus, um, you know, let's call our infinitesimal DX, call our infinitesimal Y plus DY. You know, this is dy. Um, it equals um, f of, well, I don't know. I mean, f of x plus, 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 plus dx, I assume. Right. And presumably that's going to be f prime of um, 
it's going to be, sorry, let's try to remember our, our calc one here, f of x plus f prime of x dx plus another infinitesimal. Um, and so you get that, but at some point, um, at some point, you know, you'll be taking a standard part um, and if you took the standard part of this, you'd get zero or you get f of x because these two terms would both go away. But if you divide this by, if you, if you, if you divided this, this part of it, oh, uh, if you divided this part of it by, um, by, by, by the appropriate, you know, infinitesimal, Oh, this is, this is, uh, this is yeah. Let, I mean, let, let, let me phrase the question perhaps <laughs> differently, totally. Yeah. Different. I mean, this is a naive question to me. I, I don't work in the area, I'm, I'm not an expert. But uh, going back to the pictures in your lecture at the beginning, in the first uh, two or three, uh, the thing that came to mind is that I can visualize the complex numbers. Uh, very well in an in, uh, at least I fool myself that I understand what's going on when I when I look at something like a stereographic projection I I, I can make sense of the point at infinity now mm -hmm. if I were to do an stereographic projection on those pictures that you had uh, can I somehow visualize the the points at infinity and the infinitesimals as some little sphere that sits in there or uh, um, well, it's, it's, you know, in some sense, it's the same picture, only your sphere also has non-standard elements. Okay. <laughs> I mean, whether that's useful or not, I don't know, but, but sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's still, you know. And the, in, and the infinite part ends up being infinitesimally close to the North Pole. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. All and, right. You know, you, you can also do something like mod out. Um, you know, you can take the complex numbers and you can you can sort of mod out um, to to form kind of a compactification, where you sort of identify any two any two numbers out of the infinite part. You identify them, and what you get is you get um, you know you get an enormous an enormous uh, copy of the unit disk. And and that's useful for things. Some uh, there's a, you know, there's a proof by by, by somebody at, at 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 CUNY, I think Liebman, um, of the uh, um, fundamental theorem of uh, of algebra, using using that picture, mm. because then every polynomial turns out to be a a genuine rotation when restricted to right, the boundary. Driving out, yeah, trying to understand uh, these things from that point of view, yeah, yeah. Mm, okay, it's interesting. I, uh, I, yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Are you done, Carlos? I just... Yes, I am. Yeah, thanks. So somehow uh, there is some uh, uh, standard magic that says from the infinitesimal proof. Uh, it is true that for every epsilon, there's a delta such that if you have your delta deformation of your polynomial f, the roots are of the deformed polynomial are within epsilon of the roots of the original polynomial. Um, but there's no way to get explicit values for those epsilons and deltas. It's just for every epsilon, no. there is a delta, and that's that's what you know. And and in some sense, it's even worse, right? Because um, Let's go up or it's, oh. So this lemma that every root of G is close to a root of F, the corresponding lemma in the standard proof that, 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 that you gave last week, given an epsilon, given an epsilon ball around a root of F, we were able to, you, you actually constructed, you came up with a constructive bound on the root on Delta so that you could get a root of G with, within epsilon of that root. So that was extremely constructive. Applied mathematicians who also use this kind of thing um, would be very happy with what, what showed up uh, last week. Here, um, it's not even clear what would, go, what would be going on. 
it's possible to translate this proof into a standard proof. I mean, any, any, any non-standard proof that doesn't use very much of the non-standard machinery can be translated. It can even be done algorithmically. Uh, all the interesting non-standard stuff uses machinery that, that makes that impossible, like, like uh, load measures and, 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 and uh, high degrees of saturation and stuff. But, but this proof could be translated back, but it's not even clear what this is saying. Right, because if you're letting G approach F, so you suppose you have a sequence of G's approaching F, their roots could be jumping all over the place. And so it's not clear which root you've got. So the corresponding standard version of this would be something like if you've got a sequence of G's approaching F, I mean, whose coefficients approach the coefficients of F, and you pick a root for each of those then there's a subsequence with the property that that subsequence approaches, approaches one of the roots of F. So it gets very awkward and, 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 and no, uh, no um, estimation for anything. I, I don't think you can pull any estimate out of this. So it's, it's actually, it's a much easier lemma than the corresponding lemma of the standard argument you gave last, last week. I mean, this proof is, is basically trivial. Um, but um, it carries a, a lot less information. So Carlos, I have a question for you yes. uh, or for anyone who knows some uh, algebraic geometry. So if you take like a polynomial uh, f of x and you find it has a zero, f of a is equal to zero, but then, um, you know, if the derivative at a is zero, then it's a multiple root and so, so you know what the multiplicity of a root is. Right. So suppose you have a hypersurface or a curve, just a curve, and you have some point on the curve where let's say f of x, y, f of a, b equals zero. So, um, so I assume that there's a standard way to define the multiplicity of that point a, b on the curve. Naively, in, in, you can ask how many tangents. <laughs> pass through that point, uh, uh, but that's, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, uh, you, you cannot always rely on that picture. Yes, but that's. Uh, and if you're doing something as simple, just like f of x, y uh, equals zero, um, like if you have f of x equals zero, f of a is zero, you have uh, the multiplicity is k if the polynomial is x minus a to the k times something. So is there a similar, very explicit way to describe the multiplicity of a point on a curve? Uh, yes and no. I mean, you have to build up uh, constructions that tell you how close the tangent is to the... Uh, uh, you probably, when you teach calculus, you talk about the tangent being uh, double multiplicity or so. Uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, there, there are standard formulas that allow you to uh, define the multiplicity of a, of a point. Uh, but uh, those, in some sense, hide the fact that you are using some sort of formal derivative uh, here and there. So, uh, I mean, that, that this, this was a major problem in, uh, in the early history of uh, algebraic geometry, the definition of uh, multiplicity. And if you remember a little bit about your history, I think uh, Andre Weil used to have a lot of fights uh, with the Italian geometers precisely because they didn't define that uh, correctly. But uh, there are th th there is a, a, a well-known formula, for example, given by uh, Serre. Uh, but uh, it's using some homological algebra. But it, in the end, you're basically feeding information about uh, uh, the, uh, the higher derivatives at a particular point. Uh, I, I mean, if you, if you, uh, you know, in, the, in the, the most naive way, you look at a point on an algebraic curve, and uh, let's say that algebraic curve is given by some polynomial, and you look at the, at the point itself, and then you make a slight deformation uh, in the sense that you look at the point plus 
a small valley of tea and you let tea vary. You'll be able to see, you know, how that is changing. And uh, uh, the multiplicity of, uh, for example, an, an ordinary point. If you are an uh, ordinary point, if you deform a little bit the curve uh, around the point, then you, you'll see the different points showing up. Uh, so uh, I, I mean, if you are looking for a, a, a precise definition for a, a formula for the, the intersection multiplicity, then uh, you know, the point to start, the, there are formulas given by the classical Italian geometers, but the, the most uh, uh, common one is the one produced by Serre, which uses uh, uh, some homological algebra with the tor functors and so on. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, it depends on what you want to use. I mean, if you, if, I, if you look at a standard book like Harshon's uh, definition of uh, intersection, I mean, he presents the different proofs of the Italians, or at least the most common ones. Uh, but uh, the refinements, which uh, really began with Sariski and uh, other people in the Urbaki, uh, uh, the Urbaki group, uh, eventually ended up with a very nice workable uh, definition uh, that uh, it's the one used by Sarah and Grotendick and other people. But uh, yes, there is a formula. The question is how complicated do you want the formula to be? Right. So the reason I ask is the following. If you, if you go back just to the case of a polynomial on one variable, so uh, F and you, that, uh, so F of Z and G of Z is some deformation. It's relatively easy to prove that if you look at the, uh, the roots of F, for every root of f, there's a root of g, you know, within epsilon of the root of f. What's a little right. bit harder to prove, that was like the second part of David's proof today, is that you can, uh, the multi for each root of f with multiplicity k, there is an infinitesimally close root of g with exactly the same multiplicity. So to show that the, if you have your polynomial f and the deformation g, to show that the set of roots are uh, infinitesimally close to each other is relatively easy. And the little bit harder part is to show that the multiplicities are the same. That's the theorem on the continuity of roots of polynomials. Right. So, so David sent me a, his paper a couple of days ago that he talked about today. And, um, and so using uh, my extensive knowledge of non-standard analysis, uh, I could prove that if you take any affine variety um, and deform it, then um, the deformed variety, or, or take, you, you take your set of polynomials defining a variety, you deform, deform your polynomial slightly. So there's a, the associated variety with the deformation. And that variety is infinitesimally close. The two varieties are infinitesimally close. So that's very easy to do. Um, but uh, the harder thing would to be to show that you that you preserve multiplicities at every point on your variety. Um, and uh, since I don't know how to calculate the multiplicity of a point, on, even on a curve, uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten to that part of the uh, presumptive right. theorem yet. Yeah. But presumably, if it's true, I mean, it has to be true, obviously, if you if you have a variety and you deform the 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 ideal slightly, then the variety the, the the new variety you get is is just a infinitesimally close to the old variety. So, right. I mean that I can prove that I proved uh, using basically nothing, um, but um, uh, to match the multiplicities is uh, something I haven't figured out yet. Mm. Yeah, the, uh, I, I mean, one classical procedure was that, uh, let's say you have a double point and uh, what can you do to somehow, there are two tangents passing through that point and what you want to do is to visualize some way of deforming uh, the ambient space so that the tangents actually do not touch and they, and this is, the, the classical situation was to perform a quadratic transformation. Uh, and uh, apparently that gave another way of, uh, you can separate somehow the points. So uh, if you have a, a double point, 
then by means of a quadratic uh, transformation, it may be possible to actually uh, separate them. Uh, how many quadratic transformations you have to carry out would give you information as to the multiplicity of the point. Uh, uh, but for algebraic polarities, I think that there are, uh, I mean, there's a whole subject of the formations uh, that are uh, I'm, I'm not very familiar with, but uh, a, a key point is how to measure the multiplicity of a point in a, uh, an affine polarity. Uh, and that is usually done by these formulas that come out uh, are generalizations of the uh, of the survey homological uh, formula. Uh, but so the uh, example you gave just gave like of a double point. Um, is that just an instance of what's called resolution of singularities? Yes. Yes. The the uh, basic idea of the Italian geometers was that you started with an algebraic curve, let's say homogeneous polynomial in three variables. And you uh, have a multiple point, and you want to transform that algebraic equation in such a way that that multiple point separates. And so, what they used to do was to carry it out the so called quadratic transformations. Uh, X would be uh, uh, replaced by uh, quadratic in the other variables, and Y and Z, and you would perform the transformation, and uh, uh, you could keep track of what was happening to the tangents. And uh, somehow, but uh, it was a little bit more delicate because there's often uh, there would be points that you would not see that this procedure would not detect and what to do uh, about it. But uh, yes, I, basically, I mean, the question, if I give you a polynomial, what, how do you desingularize it? Uh, in the but, sense that you- So why did people even want to do this? I mean, I have no problem with a, a cusp. I mean, you know, you have the curve. Oh, no, this, they, Why, they were, what's the matter with that? No, there, there were a lot of interesting facts uh, going around. I mean, often the uh, uh, multiplicity of a point uh, would be connected with other invariants. Uh, for instance, how many uh, tangents to an algebraic curve can pass through a point? And uh, so there, there were a lot of things. I mean. A game that was played quite frequently was uh, given an algebraic curve, there is a so-called dual curve. If the algebraic curve is in projective uh, uh, to a space, you can uh, define another algebraic curve whose points correspond to the tangents on the original curve. And that's the dual curve. And then the question is, how do these things intersect each other? And counting those intersections, there were a lot of interesting formulas. So I mean, if you look at it, a book like Walker's, uh, Walker was a student of Sariski. He's got all these formulas, uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, uh, I mean, there are several invariants uh, uh, attached to an algebraic curve, uh, like the genus, and uh, uh, but the multiplicity of a point uh, is, it was an important invariant. And uh, what happens to that multiplicity when you deform or when you make a fine transformations. So th th there was ample motivation to actually <laughs> desingularize these gadgets. Mm. Thank you. All so, right. you know, I, I should say, I know practically no algebraic geometry, but it has been a topic of interest in the logic community going back um, you know, going back to uh, Tarski, at least, because there's this, uh, for a logician, there's this notion of a definable set, and it's very much like a variety. It's sort of a generalization of a variety. And there are lots of people who do um, what's called model theory and logic that, 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 that pay a lot of attention to, to these sorts of questions and, and to, for example, this risky topology. Um, and, um, you know, how, how that connects because non-standard analysis is basically, uh, it's an application of model theory, uh, some of the same arguments may be going on in that community that might work better on the question that Carlos asked me earlier, for example. It's just, it's, it's outside my, my, my sphere of knowledge. If, if Angus McIntyre were here, for example, he would probably say, oh yes, and, and point to, to, to several papers. 
May I quickly change the subject and say something wild on the, put something wild on the table? Of course. So, uh, uh, you know, there is this theorem in mathematical economics, which uh, David, you may know, uh, it's called uh, um, uh, De Bro mentel sonnenschein theorem. And that is a continuous function uh, on Rn with certain properties. And you can then construct an economy precisely defined uh, whose excess demand is that function. So there's a very negative result because it says there's no hope for equilibrium of that economy because any crazy function you choose, provided it's continuous, uh, you can construct an economy which will have well-behaved economy which would give rise to that function. And the proof of that is through polynomials, as I recall, uh, approximate, approximating that function through polynomials. So your talk leads me to ask, uh, can, you re can one rephrase that theorem to say that if that function is deformed, then the resulting, uh, then the infinitesimally deformed, if you like, or epsilon delta deformed, then the economy is correspondingly epsilon delta or infinitesimally deformed, such that the deformed economy will have the same uh, excess demand function as the, as the deformed uh, demand function. And that would be very interesting to see if non-standard analysis uh -huh. or in particular your theorems shed any light on that. Uh -huh. It's interesting. But I may be wild. I may be talking wild. But, but it did, the idea did come to me. Yes, David, could you close your screen share? Oh, yes, of course. Um, and maybe I can't. There we go. <laughs> oh, you just did. Yeah. Okay. I just... Uh... Just gives us a better picture of everybody. All right. What else is new in the world? <laughs> Let's see. Anyone here ha undergo a complete audit of their income taxes? <laughs> the probability oh. is very low. Wait a What's the probability that two of us have had complete audits? That's the interesting question. Uh, yes. Do, do you do your own or do you send it out for a, uh, to an accountant or to Sorry? a tax accountant? Do you do your own or you send it to a tax accountant? No, 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 no. It's a mathematical question that made the front page of the New York Times. Oh, Yesterday oh. and today. <laughs> oh, uh, didn't see that. Oh yeah, well, it's because, um, let's see, there's James Comby, what was it? The guy who was the head of the FBI? Yeah. Uh, uh, Comey, Comey. Comey, yes. And then there was another guy who was like the number two guy at the Justice Department, uh, both of whom Trump <laughs> got rid of. And uh, evidently there are like, um, I don't know, 153 million tax returns every year of which uh, roughly a thousand out of the 153 million are chosen at random for exhaustive audits, which is supposed to be hell on the individual. And Somehow, both Comey and this other guy, uh, whom uh, Trump didn't like, got picked at random <laughs> for these audits. So, so did the New York that. Times ask the, ask the question of what the probability was? Well, it's implicit. They say, you know, what I mean, they don't do <laughs> it mathematically. They say a couple of thousand out of 153 million. How can it be that? But no, you can do the calculation, but. Uh, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, lots of high school teachers will be assigning this as a, a homework problem to their classes in elementary probability. Many years ago, um, the lottery number uh, on 9-11 was 9-1-1, or a lottery number, <laughs> and for, the new, for, for some New York lottery. And when this happened, of course, all the the mathematicians in New York were 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 home, you know, home having dinner or something because it was it was evening, and so uh, they called Hawaii, and so the New York Post interviewed me on, on on the probability of this happening, and I gave a back of the envelope uh, calculation, and um, they 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 reversed it in the in the story to make it seem far more probable. And then I started getting hate mail from people who were, <laughs> who were choosing lottery numbers based on my, on, 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 on my misreported estimate from the New York Post. 
but but that 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 was something that 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 reinforced the longstanding feeling that I had, which is that every newspaper article, especially in papers like the Post, that that there's a requirement on the journalists by the by the the company that owns the paper that they have to have at least one major error in every article. Um, right. So where I live in the state of New Jersey, there's of course a state lottery, and one year. It was, the big prize was won, coincidentally, by the wife of some big mafia guy. Well, everyone said that's not very likely, but it happened. You know, it could happen. People got a little bit suspicious when a year or two later, the wife of the same mafia guy <laughs> won the lottery a second time. <laughs> but, you know, that's my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I was, I was even uh, before I was in Hawaii, I was, I spent a year in, in the statistics department at Oregon, Oregon State. And they didn't have a lottery then, but they were considering one. And somebody in the government had sent a proposal to the uh, uh, statistics department at Oregon, at Oregon State, asking them to look over it and see what, what they have to say about it. And, and somehow it ended up coming to me. Everybody was passing it off like a hot potato. And it, and it came to me and I was looking through it and it was just full of ad hocery as far as how they were gonna do the randomizations. And so I'm sure all my colleagues had seen the same thing. And, and my immediate reaction was, no, 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 I'm not touching this thing at all. But um, so I, I sent it back and I don't know what they, I mean, they eventually got a lottery, but I don't know how they eventually validated the uh, the procedure. But I know that in the early days of lotteries, they were very much not random. They were using things like linear congruential generators to, to generate the uh, the randomness and and with enough data you could you could uh, you know you could you could solve it and find out what the generating mechanism was. And there were some some real problems with early lotteries being very much predictable. Um, but I, hopefully this is all solved nowadays and the lotteries are completely on the up and up, as are the way they choose who to, who to audit. <laughs>